Vietnam as an architect of buildings, and I left Vietnam as an architect of social change. In my early career, I was working at Gensler & Associates, a big architectural firm that many of you may know. And we were doing incredible big buildings. And it was all beautiful, large-scale buildings. And I know many people are really excited and passionate about that kind of work with glass and steel. But the medium just didn't speak to me. And so I left Gensler. And a group of architects that I had met from Russia invited me to Russia. And you really shouldn't invite me, because I come. And I ended up um, visiting and staying there and actually doing construction administration on a project there. I then traveled further uh, through the Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, and actually all through Asia. But I fell in love with Southeast Asia. And I moved to Hanoi and had a wonderful opportunity to work and renovate old French villas as offices for companies like Chase Manhattan and Price Waterhouse. And so it was a wonderful opportunity. I really enjoyed it. But while I was there, I had a first witness to um, a terrible event where I saw a father sell his daughter to a European man for sex. She was six years old. I tried to intervene, and I was held at knife point. And I was unsuccessful in changing the outcome for that little girl. But in that moment, I knew I had to do something, and I couldn't turn my back on this issue. So what happened to me that night really moved me, grabbed me, and wouldn't let me go. And I think these are the things that happen to us when we are thinking about these social issues around the world, and we have this really visceral reaction to them. And sometimes that really clouds our judgment about how we see the problem and how we clearly could see how we can make a difference in a solution. So as I sat there in my hotel room, and I was really rattled, I started realizing something. I started looking at human trafficking as a marketplace, where unfortunately the commodity is a person. But when you start to look at something in a different way, it allows you to redefine the problem. And so if I looked at human trafficking as an economic mechanism, then I knew I could actually create an alternative economic options for these people. So I started to research human trafficking. I didn't like what I found. But what I learned was that prevention is key because the traumatizing effects are devastating. I learned that safety comes from the community because when communities are strong, they don't fall into desperate situations. I learned that urban migration trends are also important in how people fall prey. Because when people move from the village to the city, this is when they're extremely vulnerable at that particular juncture. And surprisingly, I learned that artisans are at risk of falling into human trafficking because they are paid low, low wages for their, for their work. So I went to the marketplace. And I was in a village marketplace. And I was surrounded by everyone selling their wares. And I saw chickens were everywhere. And there was barrels of fresh fish from the Mekong. And there was colors of red and yellow hues um, all around me. And I saw, I saw the section of the marketplace where there are the textiles, sarongs and scarves, of every color and every texture. And I really wanted to know more about them. I wanted to know about the process, the designs, who, who made all these beautiful, incredible artistry. So I asked the vendor if she could tell me who made all this. And so the next morning, she took me to the weaving villages. There are whole weaving villages in Southeast Asia that are organized around, the whole community is organized around weaving. The houses are raised, and there's looms underneath every home. And I meet the weavers, and I hear the clacking of the looms as they tighten down the threads. I see the spinning wheels, and my mind begins to spin. Because what I'm seeing is incredible artistry. And remember, what I've learned in my research, I'm really concerned about their safety. I believe you have to be a disruptive entrepreneur. Well, what does that mean, right? 
Well, disruptive entrepreneur really cares about the meaning as well as the money. And it also redefines um, about massive problems and inspires others to do the same, who really challenge traditional business models in a way within their intuitiveness and their insight and their ingenuity. So in 2004, I launched Lulan Artisans, a for-profit social venture to create sustainable livelihoods for artisans to prevent human trafficking. We work with over 800 weavers, dyers, and spinners in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, and India. We create, design, and produce uh, sustainable textiles. By increasing the livelihoods of these artisans, we reduce the likelihood that they will fall into any trouble. They don't think of themselves as poor. They think of themselves as rich in skills. So we use design and fabrics in order to do social change. So this is Meng. She is one of our weavers in Cambodia. And her, and her husband works with us as well. And uh, she, I love this picture. I love how the light is um, coming through her fingers. Um, we, we actually pay our artisans fair trade wages. And we actually give the children an education. And we actually give housing stipends through our weaving centers. And our weaving centers, as you can see, um, we use uh, sustainable uh, bamboo for shade. And we use a lot of different sustainable practices. We use natural dyes and low impact dyes. And we use natural fibers that are there locally and have been there for centuries. And here are some of the natural dyes. I also like to show this uh, slide about the innovation of using a bicycle wheel to do spinning. <laughs> we use rice husks, as you can see in here, to boil the water for the dyes. And then we use the ash to sell back to the farmers to use as fertilizer to grow flowers. So we use a lot of different sustainability. We think of ourselves as sustainability and 4D, which I call um, economic, environmental, cultural, and socially. And I really think that the cultural is really, really important. Many people think that they're starting a company. I would argue that you're not. I'd argue that what you want to really start is to create a container for collaboration, where you actually can have deep relationships and partnerships. When I was first starting my company, I actually was doing research in the library at Gensler. And I knew the librarian there because of the work I used to work there. And I told him all about my company that I wanted to start. I told him about the vision and the mission. And about, I don't know, a couple hours later, he comes over and he walks over and he hands me a card in a very zen way. <laughs> he hands me this card. And it has a woman's name. And it says, textile designer. And he says, you will want to call her. You will want to work with her. And she will get exactly what you're doing. So I called her, and she invited me over to her house, and we met, and I sat down. And remember, this is the beginning of my company. I have nothing to show but my words and my passion. And so I tell her about my business, my vision, and the name of the company, which is all I had. And I, still, I started telling her the story of the weavers. And you, you wouldn't imagine her face just really lit up. And she goes, I'm in. You don't have to tell me anything else. I'm in. That's Laura Guido Clark, who is a famous textile designer, colorist, and design extraordinaire. She works with such big companies as Apple, uh, Ray Anderson's Floor and Interface, and other companies as well. And we, a couple weeks ago, we had another conversation about collaborating on the next design collection. And she. She said, I'm, I'm in. I still love what Lulan is and what it's become. And so I think what happens is that if you really do build the right kind of business, really, you're inviting people to join. And you're just inviting a really cool party. And everybody wants to be a part of it. And that people show up, they stay. They validate the work. They spark new ideas. 
and they actually bring such life into it. And her collaboration, Laura's collaboration, creates this layering effect of making even the other collaborations even deeper. I mean, her contribution is palpable. So I wanted to talk also about reach deep, reach out. This is another interesting story. You know, from 1995 to 2004, before I launched my company, I actually did research and built relationships for nine years. Because I realized that the market wasn't really ready, and the artisans, and even myself, didn't have the skills to start the business that I had the idea of starting. So to start with the artisans, when I first started talking with them, they had great capabilities. And I was learning about the weaving cooperatives. But they didn't know about international shipping. They didn't know about duty rates. They didn't know about having the consistency of design and color. So I knew that they weren't really ready yet. But I thought I would just start working with them. And we did. And I started to actually what I would call incubating them and myself and, le and, and learning how to work with them. I knew that the market wasn't ready. Because you know, I knew about fair trade, and I knew about uh, Jim Thompson, if you know about this silk company that was out there. But there wasn't a large enough market for the vision that I had for Lulon. So I decided I would have to wait for the right time in the market. I did have internet 1.0 experience, and I saw a lot of great ideas just launched at the wrong time. And so timing is really critical. And in 2002, I saw the green movement developing, and I said, oh yeah, this is going to be a big enough market that I could actually start the kind of company I want to and ride the coattails of something much larger than what was already these niche markets. And then as for me, I had nine years additional experiences in starting a company, working for startups, and working for nonprofits. And with all those, I really felt ready so what happened was nine years incubation, and I could have never predicted that that would happen, that I would have even started a company. It was still something only in the back of my mind. And so the artisans were ready, the market was ready, and I was ready. So we launched, and it was wonderful. So it's bigger than you think, and it's not what we think. So when I started Lulon Artisans, I thought it was about design, sustainable fabrics, and prevention of human trafficking. I didn't know that it was about agriculture, water, and land right issues. Because when you start these types of products and companies, and that's what you think you're focused on, you actually find yourself really involved in many, many different things, because everything's interconnected. It really is a holistic type of company. Well, our next phase of our business is that we want to go to other countries in Asia. And we also want to go to other regions of the world. And so it was autumn last year, and I had just given a lecture in Copenhagen. And there was this after party, and there was eating and champagne and drinking and uh, live music. And a woman came up to me and said, I loved your talk, and I want to get involved with Lulan. How can I get involved? And I said, well, I've got this idea of how I want to go into new countries. I have this idea how I want to decentralize the business model and find training centers which can act like nodes to work with other cooperatives in that country. And I tell her my story of what I want to do and how do I want to expand. And she then starts to tell me about her experience in weaving. I mean, 20 years experience. And she's managed many cooperatives in her country. And she starts telling me why I should come to her country. And I tell her, well, do the research, let me know, and if you think it can be locally run, locally managed, locally funded, I'm in. So months later, I didn't think I'd hear from her again. And I, I get in my inbox this rigorous report, like 30, 40 pages, and it has everything in there to actually start to do this exact business model that I talked about. So guess what? That's the next country that Lulan is going in. And what I love about it is that we didn't choose the country we're going in. She did. She chose the next country that we're going in. So 
I look around the, the world and I see the issues before us increasing. And I look around the room and I see so many talented, creative individuals here. And so many opportunities to make a difference and make an indelible mark on our world. So, be disruptive. Reach deep, reach out. Pay attention to what moves you, grabs you, and won't let you go. Thank you. Thank you.